This is chapter 29 from Michael Capuzzo's The Murder Room. It's the first part of a case. It's called The Case of the Shoeless Corpse. In old Philadelphia, where horse-drawn hansoms rattled over cobblestones, stood an old brick tavern open for business on and off for two centuries with the sign of the loaves and roasts creaking in the wind. The 18th century edifice once commanded the New World Harbour as the most genteel tavern in North America, John Adams said. Washington, Jefferson, Franklin, Madison and Adams dined and drank their way through the drafting of the Declaration of Independence and the US Constitution there. Now it was an elegant neo-colonial restaurant and tourist watering hole that seemed lost in time. The mass of visitors walked by heading to Independence Hall as if the tavern was at Second and Walnut was not vis visible. During the great celebrations of Independence two centuries ago, full-length portraits of Lafayette and General Washington were painted in the tavern windows, backlit by candlelight. On Thursday morning, April the 30th, 1992, the windows were marbled by more disturbing images. The corpse of a lovely young woman, blonde and petite, filled the projection screen at the north end of the hall. Deborah Lynn Wilson, 20 years old, was lying on her back at the bottom of a stairwell on the campus of Drexel University in Philadelphia. The senior mathematics major, a former model, had been severely beaten and strangled to death. Seven years later, no one had been arrested for the murder and Vidoc Society members had assembled from London, Paris, New York and Virginia to examine their ninth murder case, the death of Deborah Wilson. Philadelphia Police Sergeant Robert Snyder, a homicide detective in his 40s with sandy hair and intense blue eyes, took the podium. The highly respected detective had worked the case for much of seven years. Snyder worked headline cases, but this one stumped him. You always feel bad about the cases you don't solve, he told the society, especially the ones involving the young, the innocent and the aged. This is one of the innocents. Walter, putting down his coffee, snapped to attention and looked up. He saw at once why no arrests had been made after seven years and why police detectives and a private eye hired by the family were still confused. The murder scene contained no signs of the common motivations cops were trained to observe, no obvious clues implicating money or sex, no signs of robbery. Deborah's body was covered by the down quilted grey overcoat she had donned that chilly morning of November the 30th, 1984, the week after Thanksgiving. Her winter gloves were still stuffed in the pockets of the overcoat. Her wrist, rock, wrist watch was still on her wrist. Nor was there a recognisable sexual assault. Deborah Wilson died still fully clothed in jeans and a blue long-sleeved pullover blouse, except for her feet, which were bare. Only her white Reebok sneakers and socks were missing. There was no rational reason Deborah Wilson had to die. The police would make no progress until they broke out of investigative routine and accepted the fact that the crime was beyond normal human comprehension and traditional standards of morality, or amorality for that fact. This was no ordinary murder. It was a gruesome act of depravity. It was a new age crime, a me generation murder. It wasn't one of those pre-1960s killings that cops now saw in a bizarre haze of near nostalgia. A jealous man shoots his two-timing wife, a law partner gets snuffed for half the firm. Those old-time killers were almost understandable to average folks. The cops always knew where to look, the husband, the law partner, someone the dead man knew well. But this kind of murder, a lovely, wholesome young woman killed for no reason at all, this was crazy time, cops figured. But it wasn't crazy. It was sane, methodical, cold, well-planned. 
just another middle-class American exploiting the bounty of unprecedented affluence and freedom, steady employment, his own house and car, ample leisure time, a king's lib library of depraved instructional media images, a large supply of young, tolerant, fun-seeking acquaintances. All the resources, in other words, that only aristocrats like the Marquis de Sade once possessed to sample and deeply explore their hungers. Just an everyday late 20th century American monster. De Tocqueville warned of the dumbing down of America, but he never imagined this. The elite forms of evil had gone mass market. Still looking up at the screen, Walter thought to himself, young man, I know what you're up to. One ought not do such things. You can't hide from me. As Snyder began to describe the case, Walter sensed an air of excitement in the 18th century hall. He detected a new seriousness, an intense focus from his peers. Fleischer had said the eyes of the world were on them now. Adding to the anticipation, another prominent journalist guest, Louis Beale, a writer on assignment for the Los Angeles Times, was sitting at Fleischer's table scribbling notes. Beale specialised in cop stories. He had interviewed the LA cops who advised Hill Street Blues director Barry Levinson about his TV series Homicide and Sidney Lumet, director of Serpico. When he described the Vidoc Society, it sounded like a 50s film noir band of forensic brothers who pool their experience and, and intellect attempting to solve the unsolvable. Fleischer, Walter and Bender were astonished. The Vic Victor, Vic Vidoc Society had become the media flavour of the moment. A noted film agent who sold the classic mob pick Goodfellas wanted to represent them. A month earlier, the Sunday Philadelphia Inquiry had touted the colourful club as avengers of unsolvable crimes. A week after that, the Sunday Miami Herald published the same story under the headline, This Club's Who Whodunits Are Real. Suddenly, there was pressure to solve crimes, not just discuss them. The Sunday New York Times, the previous spring, had captured the society's fanciful Sherlock Holmes style with its dispatch. First they dine, then talk turns to murder. While opportunities were nice, Walter kept them focused on reality. Point A, we didn't start this for recognition. Point B, we haven't done anything to deserve recognition. Point C, journalists are romanticising us, turning us into heroes to sell newspapers. Point D, they wouldn't be able to do this unless there was a real need. It doesn't matter how they portray us. The fact of the matter is crime is out of control in our society. People need our help. The publicity had brought requests flooding into the Vidoc Society's P.O. box in Philadelphia, in letters, packages, court files, pleas for help, songs of woe. A Los Angeles man wanted the Society to investigate his father's murder, which had occurred 30 years earlier. A United States congressman needed confidential assistance to solve a friend's murder. The desire to help was animating the whole Society. Friel's return from Texas and the National Organisation of Parents of Murdered Children had lit a fire. Fleischer boasted in the Times that, this, that the society was a college of detectives without equal in the world. Now they had a chance to prove it. Friel backed his Texas conversation with more than words. It was Friel who persuaded Sergeant Snyder to present Wilson's murder before the group for a fresh set of eyes. Friel had worked with Snyder in the, in the Homicide Division in 1984 when Deborah Wilson was killed, and although he didn't work the case, he and Snyder talked about it often over the years. The college student's murder still bothered him. Friel knew what Snyder was feeling, especially towards the end of his career when he was running out of chances. Bob Snyder is truly a legend in Homicide, the consummate homicide detective, Friel said but there are cases you can't let go of. Walter was impressed as he appraised Snyder at the podium. 
It was an important step that one of the city's finest detectives had asked for their help. When mobster Frankie Flowers was killed in the Mafia Wars, Snyder was the shoe leather the department sent out to find the killer. Walter felt bad for the hard-working cops and also for Deborah. He knew how they stewed in a hard boil of grief and rage, haunted by an unanswerable question. Why? There was no rational reason. Closure was impossible. It's time to out the bastard, he thought. That much I can do. As Snyder discussed the crime scene, Walter sipped his black coffee and listened. On the evening of Friday, November 29th, 1984, Deborah was working late on a computer project in Randall Hall, a landmark campus building, the detective said. The ornate stone edifice built in 1901 was a huge labyrinth of classrooms and offices, famously difficult to navigate. At 11pm, Deborah called her parents home across the river in New Jersey from a computer lab. She said she had to keep working to finish the assignment due the next morning. Gifted at mathematics, her major, Deborah struggled with other courses, including computer science. But she was a disciplined student who put in the long hours needed to excel. She didn't have a boyfriend, though young men were interested in her and didn't smoke or drink. She had modelled and played clarinet in high school, but focused on academics in college. Living at home with her parents and commuting to Drexel, she kept her eyes on the future. She wanted to be an engineer, her sister Suzanne Lees had said. She was determined she could do it. A photograph of a new Mercedes-Benz sedan hung on her bedroom wall as incentive. Her parents often fretted about their open, trusting, somewhat naive young daughter working late in the crime-ridden West Philadelphia neighbourhood, but Deborah assured them the engineering building was safe and when she was done, she would get a security escort to her car. Two and a half hours later, at 1.30 in the morning, Deborah called home again and told her parents she still needed another hour to complete the project, but they shouldn't worry. Her ex-boyfriend, Kurt Rana, was there with her in the computer room. He'd wait and walk her to her car. But Rana didn't wait. He left the computer room shortly afterward. On his way home, he asked a camp campus security guard to make sure Deborah got safely to her car and the guard passed word to campus guard Davis Dixon, uh, David Dixon. Dixon patrolled the campus on the midnight to 8am shift and was responsible for the computer room. A few minutes after 1.30 in the morning, Deborah was alone in the lab working on the computer when she was attacked. At 1.38 in the morning, computer records show she had made her last transaction on the computer. It seemed hurried, as if she was interrupted, said Drexel Computer Administrator John J. Gould Jr. It looked like she stopped in the middle of what she was doing. Snyder had reconstructed the likely events. Her attacker apparently surprised her and beat her into submission, Snyder said. Then he strangled her to death with an electrical extension cord... The cord was discarded near the computer, its grooves matching the marks on Deborah's neck. At three in the morning, when her parents hadn't heard from her, they reassured themselves she was sleeping in the computer room while pulling an all-nighter. In fact, by three in the morning, according to the coroner, she was already dead. In the huge, dark, empty building, her killer carried or dragged her body through the maze of halls, and through a door that led to a protected concrete stairwell on the outside of the building. At the bottom of the cold, quiet stairwell on the bitter winter night, he continued to savagely beat her corpse with two bricks, a yard-long piece of lumber and a strip of metal. The three makeshift weapons were found lying near her body, smeared with her blood. At nine that morning, two passing students found Wilson's body in the stairwell on a landing 11 steps below street level. As Snyder spoke, <clears throat> Fleischer passed around additional pictures of Wilson's body, 
a blood stain found in the computer room and the type of computer she was working on when she died and the type of sneakers she was wearing. White Reeboks, white socks. Fleischer joined Snyder at the podium and opened the floor to questions. What about the security guard? Fleischer himself started it off. Dixon was an immediate suspect, Snyder said. He was the obvious choice. In police interviews, he was shaky about his whereabouts during the course of the evening, but he had an alibi. He told the other guard on duty he'd been talking on the phone with his girlfriend and forgot to escort Wilson to her car. He failed part of a polygraph test, but polygraphs are inadmissible in court. We never had enough to arrest him, Snyder said. The questions came in a torrent. Was there a janitor on duty at the time? No, Snyder said. Were there any arrests for burglary made on campus that night? No. Have you tried DNA testing? Heads turned to Halbert Fillinger, the veteran Philadelphia medical exam examiner. There may be traces of the killer's skin nuclei on the cord he used to strangle her if he gripped it tightly enough, he said. That residue could be tested for the killer's DNA. Puzzled looks went around the room. DNA testing had not been available when Wilson was killed in 1984, nor was it a well-known technology eight years later. It's a long shot, the Los Angeles Times reporter concluded, but right now Snyder is willing to clutch on to any suggestion. He's frustrated by his inability to move the case forward. After half an hour, Snyder slumped at the podium. The question and answer session was winding down and he'd gotten little more than free lunch, moral support and a few interesting ideas. Suddenly, Walter, whose habit, like the anchor man of a relay, was to take the baton at the end, spoke up. He frowned and adjusted his owlish black glasses on his aquiline nose. If I might offer an opinion, he began crisply, the key to the case is the absence of the victim's shoes and socks. Snyder nodded. We know the missing footwear was significant, we just didn't know how. Walter nodded. There is no robbery, yet her white Reeboks and white athletic socks are missing. Why? he asked rhetorically. Not waiting for an answer, he raised more questions. The crucial question is, what is the value of the killing? What did he propose to get? Since he didn't sexually assault her, what value was it? He tells us by the absence of the shoes and socks. He doesn't want money. She's still wearing her wristwatch. He doesn't want a fuck. He wants the shoes. He's a foot fetishist. Murmurs swept the room. Do foot fetishists kill for it? The police officer asked. No, not often, Walter acknowledged. A foot fetish is a paraphilia, a sexual deviance. Afraid to engage a living and breathing sex partner, the fetishist uses the shoe as a stand-in for anyone his imagination can, can conjure. He gains a secondary or tertiary level of sexual satisfaction through sniffing and feeling and touching and rubbing the shoe and maybe masturbating with it on him. To titters of amusement, Walter said. Foot fetishes may be bizarrely amusing, but they can be very powerful and damaging. This is why the Chinese bound their women's feet into a shape they could slip their dick into. And there was so much resistance to change. The whole culture was bounded by the power and fantasy of this fetish. Walter quickly sketched his view of the crime. The killer is obsessed with women's shoes. He collects them, masturbates over them. In all likelihood, he probably can't even sustain an erection around a real woman. It's the representation, not the reality he craves. He has noticed Wilson before and her white Reeboks. He's probably never killed anyone before, but his fantasy is escalating from merely stealing someone's shoes to confronting the wearer. Lost in his fantasy, somewhat akin to the gentleman rapist, he believes himself irresistible to women. Once he reveals his charms, she's going to say, 
Where have you been all my life? A large, powerful man, he intimidates Wilson when he enters the computer room, finding her alone. He tries to chat her up for sex or to go somewhere with him, form some sort of relationship, and she refuses. Possibly he threatens her, things like, she's a whore, being there alone, and this or that. He verbally assaults her to scare her. It doesn't matter to him. Either way, it's just a vehicle to get what he wants. He may tell himself he wants sex, a conquest, but we fool ourselves. Really, he knows the bottom line is the shoes and socks. Wilson, like many victims in this situation, tells him no, timidly or forcefully. Maybe she tells him to go to hell. It doesn't much matter. The response is fury. The fury that sparks attack, murder and post-mortem attack. Intellectually, he knows she's not going to cooperate. But on the level of fantasy, when she tells him to fuck off or whatever, he has an explosive reaction to the indignity. He had a power loss not the power gain he dreamed of, and he goes ballistic. This is the energy that fuels the crime. The killer assaults her in the computer room, beating her face and head with his fists and possibly weapons, causing her mortal agony and terror. She's screaming, pleading, and he has to shut her up, so he strangles her. He drags her corpse to the bottom of the stairwell, now his dark private lair. This is very sexual, the forensic psychologist said, giving voice to his earlier thoughts. In Freudian terms, it's the vagina, and you're going down into it. It's a sensuality independent of the fuck. He doesn't want the fuck, he wants the shoes. He'll sniff them up at home. The stairwell is a foreplay kind of entree. It helps set the sexual context later. He took what he wanted for that. He didn't, didn't want her tingly parts. He continues to beat her out of the anger of rejection of his fantasy, but really, he wants the shoes. Basically, he needs to neutralise her so he can harvest from her what he wants. He does it and leaves. Leaving with the shoes and socks, the killer is flooded with a powerful feeling of success. A power reassurance killer, seeking reassurance of his power, had repaired the assault to his pride and dignity and won. He already got what he wanted, the shoes, so he triumphs. Walter turned and looked at Sergeant Snyder. That murder scene also indicates a bit of a power-assertive guy who likes to dominate and control. A guy who lifts weights, exhibits macho power and strength with guns, hobbies such as karate. A ka uh, karate. Walter realised the Fellowship of Detectives was having an impact on him he hadn't expected. He thought the federal agents who lacked murder investigation experience were quite brilliant in the questions they ask to keep me on beam, he told the Los Angeles Time reporter. Our value isn't that we're a bunch of fucking geniuses, it's that we can call on each other. As usual, Walter's remarks required editing for the newspaper. They weren't super geniuses, he said, but they worked as a team. Snyder was pleased with the session. The profile fits my guy to a T, he said. His guy was Dixon. Walter smiled. Check Dixon's army records. Go back and interview his girlfriends, ex-wives. See if there were any problems with shoes.